Okay, so uh, today I'll uh, present a paper from NSDI 2020. It is titled Fine Grained Replication State Machine for a Cluster Storage System. Uh, I'm giving a 10,000 uh, feet overview of the paper. There's many details and yeah, I have a lot of questions about uh, the paper and uh, how it works. And yeah, so we'll talk about that. So. Uh, okay, so most of this drawing is taken from the uh, author slides. So just I'm not claiming that I'm drawing that. So the, let's start with the use case. So here we have a cluster storage system. In that case, in this scenario, we have a virtual machine provided to the different clients. There is of different sizes and a different uh, virtual machine to each client, and when this would run on a cluster physical server and each server will have multiple CPUs and storage maybe SSD or HTTP. And the interesting part is how to map from virtual disks that provided to each uh, inside each virtual machine to this physical storage here. And this is done by using uh, metadata tables and that's their purpose is to map from virtual disk to physical disk. Uh, they, the way they present is that they have a multiple layer to map and this will allow to uh, do cloning, this will allow to do uh, shared multiple extend between different users. So here for example the same extent can be uh, in different extended group. So that will reduce the total uh, storage requirement and uh, reduce uh, the cost and overhead. And the requirement, this uh, there's three metadata tables, one that is mapped from virtual uh, disk to extend, another one that is mapped from extend to extend group ID and then Extend group ID is a physic is mapped to a different disk for uh, reliability. So this metadata uh, have to be uh, kept in synchronous. It have to be durable, and it must be highly available because if, uh, that's really important for this system to work. Uh, the uh, ABI provided create. This will create key value pairs and delete will delete from a certain key, read, read some value and compare and swap. And they don't support blind uh, write. In compare and swap, that's, uh, uh, we, for a certain key, that's the old value and that's the new value. And it can su uh, succeed or not based on that. First, they start with a traditional approach, how this would be managed. So there will be multiple LSM. So, okay, let's start. They partition keys into shards, keys provided to key value stores, and this shard will be allocated to different nodes, and they replicate these nodes across uh, short for reliability and they maintain the concurrency uh, consequence using multi boxes. So basically the LSM, which is uh, logical, uh, is, is a tree. Uh, it's used to maintain this information inside each node and Baxus is responsible to share this information around uh, those nodes. and different keys will belong to different shards. So here we have nodes two and zero contain those while shard zero contain a different part of key space. Usually it will be three, but that's be the drawing a little bit harder. The basic operation is using multi access protocol. They will, the client will issue a request this request can be either read or compare and swap to the reader. The reader will issue an accept and the accept uh, 
verifying and acceptance sent it to the user, uh, to the follower. The follower will uh, acknowledge this accept, and if he gets the majority, will send he will commit it to the log for durability, and he will send this new information to the followers. The LSM table is uh, uh, divided two parts: memory for fast access and disks for durability. But this commit log is redundant because Baxos can be used uh, to uh, implement this this log. Uh, the key and value changes will be in main table and then it will be flushed to SST table and this level will be partition and flush to under, under uh, other level. I think I should... Uh, yeah. Okay, so and the commit log would be... Uh, Baxos would be like that. If the key is in main table, this would be the fastest access. If not, if not, if there is not here, uh, the algorithm have to look for the key in the is a stable level zero, level one, level two, and so on. So the paper highlights three limitation of this algorithms. The first one, there is load imbalance due to access skewness. Keys are not uh, as popular as each other. So and from their experiment using. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, metadata from actual server, they found it to be a 4x factor between different shards. Okay, and each shard has its own look. High tail latency, uh, some operation like operation 2 in this figure can uh, stop all the following operation because it's only a single log uh, with all tables. Other limitation is uh, they underutilize the throughput that uh, uh, the bandwidth that SSD can write because there is smaller read because the key is partitioned across multiple uh, shards. To solve that, they go from that uh, diagram. So I have a shard. This shard con contains different key values there, and then for each shard, I have one sequence for all the commands across the shard. They break it down into fine grained. So basically for each key, they provide a key value uh, RSM and they keep the key value and the log for that particular key. This will provide a better load balancing than the previous algorithm because now keys can uh, can be assigned to any uh, available cores in the system. And th this, of course, uh, needs some local co uh, uh, co uh, coordination between the cores so that not co two cores take the same key or so. Uh, that's fine grained load balancing, so it will be better than cross grain. Uh, also, uh, because it's uh, it separate each log for each key, this operation doesn't have to wait. So operation two here is blocking all, all the next operation. In that scenario, operation two is blocking only those operations in the same key. For the other uh, operation four, can go ahead because it's in a different key. Because it has only one uh, log for all keys, log would be uh, the batch size to write, when it's writing to disk, it would be larger, and thus we can use the uh, bandwidth of disk more efficiently. Okay, so here we, uh, why is that challenging? Because uh, RSM is expensive, it's not uh, cheap to maintain this log. They did few uh, optimization to make that happen. So the first big change they introduced is that they changed the semantic of the algorithm. So instead of depending on all the previous history, it only depends on the last part. 
I think that's uh, work for their particular use case, but I'm not think that would be a more general uh, solution. Uh, they change. So here we have for every key and uh, value, instead of having th this whole log, it will have uh, the some clock information, uh, epoch number, timestamp, and uh, the last, uh, the proposal, no the accepted value and the last uh, accepted proposal number. And so on, so that boxes can work on that. And they store uh, the speculated value for each key. And there is no much. Uh, and if one uh, key differs, the subsequent uh, access to this key will uh, fix this problem. So, so even if one machine has a, an older value and based on this older value computed and uh, uh, a wrong speculated value, it will be corrected by the other machine using uh, they, they keep a clock status and this is epic number. So it, for each key uh, created, it will have an epic number for each access. Next time, when it's deleted, it will be different for the next time. And timestamp is within the same uh, epoch number, and it will be forward uh, if there is an update for this particular key. Uh, then promise proposal number in previous phase and accepted proposal number, and chosen bit, and this will indicate if the router knows if that's the final value for this particular uh, uh, value. So that's uh, the accepted agreed upon value for that. And we will see when it will be set in uh, next slides. So compliance web processing, a client will send a request to the leader. The leader will check ownership. Uh, in checking ownership, he will compare the proposal number with the accepted number. If they are the same, he thinks that he's the owner of that key. Uh, if that's the case, he will go with the fast pass, which is uh, second phase of uh, Baxter's algorithm. So he will send uh, accept messages to the follower, and then this follower will reply with acknowledge accept acknowledgement. If successful, he will. A reply to the client, and if uh, case is problematic, uh, I've, uh, I didn't mention that client have to read the current values to get the E and T, the ebook number and uh, the ebook number and the timestamp, so that when he prepare his comparison swap request, he will advance the time. Uh, if there is a case comparison swap error. Client will be updated, and the value that has been learned from this particular uh, uh, accept uh, acknowledgement will be updated. So, next next uh, compliance swap operation by the client will learn from that. If quorum is successful, the chosen chosen bit will be set, so that the leader will know that he's the owner now for this key. Uh, compliance swap. Uh, that's for the slow pass. If the owner didn't uh, is not the owner, so he'll start with phase one of access, send a prepare request, and will wait for prepare acknowledgement, and then he will follow his accept and accept. Uh, reading uh, uh, a key. There is two requirements for each read. The return value has to be the most recent chosen value. And, and uh, accepted value with a higher epoch timestamp shouldn't be chosen. So this will create a cache error. So this will prevent other, uh, other nodes to set up this value. So it will terminate this. Uh, so basically, we have one compare swap can be active at the same time. Uh, there's two modes here. There is leader-only leader mode. 
if the leader is the owner, he will, and that's in particular operation, unless there is a failure, the leader will be the owner and he will set, uh, he will set the chosen bit for all keys in the short. He have to scan that to make sure that uh, he's the leader. And so in that particular case, he doesn't ask the other uh, nodes for uh, to achieve uh, the lead operation. So he, the one who performs the operation. The other aspect is quorum read. In that case, uh, the leader will ask uh, the other peers for their value. And if he, the leader will learn, uh, have a value that is greater than his current timestamp, he will update this value and update, propagate this information to the other uh, nodes. Uh, if there is a bending promise detected from unreachable node, that uh, a node that hasn't been replied to the leader, he will he'd like he will cancel this uh, commit by setting the time to be. Uh, greater than the time provided in this accept. So when this node uh, comes alive again, it cannot uh, change this value. Uh, there is, in the paper, there is other additional feature, delete key, and there is some discussion for bound and transport processing. So they, see, they guarantee that each compare and swap and read statement will take T seconds, and if there is a read after this T seconds, it will either get, uh, it will get the new value and will prevent other compare and swap from committing. Okay, either gets the new value or prevent the other uh, compare and swap operation to commit. Uh, the evaluation, they, uh, they work with uh, an actual cloud provider, so they have some real data, and this is data for nine hundred, almost a thousand cu customer, and the the virtual ranges from three to thirty nodes, and the typical size of metadata tables are provided here, and it's also in the appendix. There is more detailed about this exact uh, uh, configurations. So they study how read and write changes. So there is multiple uh, metadata tables and for each one, for each metadata table, he, they compare the percentage from read to write. We see it's very widely different between uh, virtual disk block to disk O B log. So it is not uniform. So it's a wide range of read and write ratios. It is not mostly read, mostly write. In their experiment, they compare the traditional approach which they refer to cross-grain RSM with their proposed approach and they, they see that the FRSM achieve much better performance. The batch here is the batch to write to the disk. So this is not very clear in this diagram, but increasing the batch make it a little bit more efficient. It is more clear here. And they compare uh, uniform workload with unscrewed workload, and it will show because how they assign if uh, cores to keys, dynamically they basically achieve the same performance, even if the uh, even if the workload is skewed. They compare, they change the number of cores, and they compare the performance. So. If, it's, uh, if RSM uses can use more cores than traditional one because not very partitioned. And they compare the latency between read and write, which I mean write here, they mean compare and swap. Compare and swap is more expensive than read, so that's all shown here. And they change uh, the ratio, how many, how many, basically how many uh, leader only read is performant in that figure, and that's uh, what they get here. And 
that's how, how many of access keys is read only is shown in this paper. So in FRSM, it's stable, but if the, the percentage of chosen bit is higher, it will be better performance. So to summarize, uh, that's some of lesson learned here. I hope that's correct. That's my intuition. Uh, so please correct me if something wrong. Uh, fine grain concurrency wins. So they don't have to maintain uh, the coordination across all, across all the shard, all keys in the shard. They have to maintain coordination only for the key level. So that's what we'll, uh, we wouldn't have multi-key operation, which is the case here. They reduce the overhead, so they have only one leader per short. And this leader manage all the keys in the short, but they have separate logs. They reduce the state by only the next state, depend only on the previous state uh, and the operation. Uh, there's some complexity here that the leader may not be the owner of all keys in the chart. I'm not sure how they can uh, guarantee that or how they can improve on that. They reduce the critical pass and optimize the common case. So they will have a large batching and uh, because failure is not common, uh, they didn't uh, uh, is not very common in their situation. So the, mostly it will be lead only operation. I think that will conclude my uh, uh, presentation and thank you. Cool, thank you. So this was just on the clock, 20 minutes. Uh, now we can have a 30 minute discussion and then during the discussion, we are going to go through the Google, um, uh, the Google Docs to uh, answer some of the questions there. And um, um, while we are doing the discussion, we are going to identify some questions that we can delve deeper into. And we are going to then have breakout sessions with three, four people in each breakout room to answer their question of choice. Uh, so there will be more um, in-depth discussion in the breakout rooms on different <coughs> topics. Then we are going to do a wrap-up session of the breakout rooms. Okay, I want to launch a pre-discussion poll. Then I will uh, bring out uh, Google Docs to um, I'll bring out the Google Docs to answer some questions there. Just two questions, just to gauge uh, your involvement. Now you can also see the see the results. Okay, so let me start sharing screen and find the um, Google Docs uh, to go over that. And, uh, Can you see the screen? 
good? Okay, cool. So we can go through the questions uh, together. Maybe if you also have um, general comments about the paper, um, feel free to make it now or after we go through some questions. Maybe my, my comments uh, about the paper is, uh, first it looked like a straightforward application of, uh, you know, of Caspaxos uh, to a distributed key value store. Uh, but um, there are some tricks uh, to it. I, mean, I like the, you know, the dirty ride sort of, and then the paid ceiling reads, uh, um, that was nice because I think Cassandra, Mongo, they have this problem about ghost rides. You don't know, you think the ride failed, but then the ride takes effect and this uh, reads um, um, prevents that kind of uh, rights, gives a finality to the right, even though the right is not um, uh, uh, put after a commit or uh, even though we don't wait for the commit, the read can give finality to the um, right. So that was nice. But I think the paper could have been presented much clearly. It's a very hard paper to delve in. We went on to several um, several offshoots. I mean, it talks about fast path in the presentation. That generally means, you know, um, a super majority quorum, etc. But th that's not it. I mean, fast path looks like what they mean by fast path is just um, stable leader optimization. And there is no super majority quorum used anywhere. But the paper kept using fast uh, uh, quorum, etc. But that was uh, that, that misled me about the paper initially. And speculation is basically saying that this is just a dirty right, I think. Um, okay, any other comments? Any other comments before we start going through these uh, questions? Try to, um, try to either answer uh, together or choose a question maybe for more in-depth discussion for the breakout uh, sessions. Yeah, not sure about the comments, but the paper is definitely uh, not the easiest paper to read. Uh, because that's not what the poll says, but uh, you know, unfortunately I couldn't vote Murat because uh, apparently co-hosts cannot vote. Right, but, right. Uh, yeah. Vote. Okay. Right. yeah. Okay. That's why we had a couple of votes actually. Okay. Yeah. okay. Talib, did you read this paper or did you saw this paper presentation? Uh, yeah, I just saw it, but um, I got the email from Alexei yesterday. I haven't actually read the paper. Um, yeah, um, so you I guess um, yeah, I, I'll need to actually read to make a comment on it. Okay. Cool. Cool. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, let's go through questions then. Uh, how could we implement FRSM using the warm space framework? What would, would be an efficient way to implement this in warm space? Warm space paper we discussed uh, last week. It provides an abstraction uh, based on this um, acceptors uh, state uh, of this right once uh, uh, um, registers and write one segments on top of that. I think this is a, this is a question that requires a longer longer answer. Maybe we can make this as a, one of the... Uh, Murat, at, at the same time, this is implementation question, really. I mean, this warm space, you already have multi -taxes. They have multi -taxes in this paper. It's just the matter of, uh, you know, trying to fiddle it in. Is, uh, could be, but warm space can allow uh, lower level um, use of the uh, wars uh, for more efficient implementation as we have seen in warm transaction. So maybe the question is, uh, is there a more efficient way to implement uh, uh, this um, in warm space? I think another uh, breakout 
room discussion could be, you know. Um, well, well I, actually, Murat, I, I think there is a, a better way in warm space uh, just because of how the, the reads are done. Right? Uh, how was the reads done? Uh, okay, w w what I mean is. Uh, in warm space, the leader is the client, right? Yeah. Does the leader keep, does the leader remember all the state? No, the state is, is, uh, is in that uh, underlying storage, right? In the, in the bosses and wars. So how does the leader yeah, in true. warm space, Paxos, how does the leader read? Right, I mean, the warm space is a law, but uh, I don't know. The read has to be the, the, you know, you have to reach out to that quorum, so it's going to be slower, no? I mean, on, on top of that... But I, I think... If, thinking on this, there could be another way, more disciplined way to use of the wars and voices to make this happen, but... Yeah, maybe this is too detailed, but... I guess one uh, general question, we may still consider this as a breakout thing or not, but um, one general question I want to consider in the breakout discussion is, how would, what, what is an alternative way to implement this and what is a better way to implement this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the reason the paper is also uh, confusing is this thing has been in deployment for eight years. This may not even have started as Paxos in mind. They came up with a solution, uh, used that, and then they started um, thinking more about the solution. And this has been in use for eight years. And when you are writing the paper, I guess, uh, they had a hard time maybe abstracting some of the, um, the core ideas, but, you know, the fine-grained uh, RSM um, thing is valid, uh, the dirty rights and reads. Maybe they could have shoehorned this into Caspexos even after the fact, so that may be a thing that may explain some of the presentation in the paper. Okay, how does uh, uh, fine-grained, uh, second question, how does fine-grained uh, RSM compare in terms of advantages, disadvantages, with Hermes? What do you guys uh, want to say? I guess one big thing is, right, Hermes has a, has a log, and this is trying to do logless using CASPAC source. Yeah, th this is not a general purpose uh, uh, application here, right? So right. it's... it's uh, you know, it's restricted to just this compare and set uh, updates, cannot do blind updates, cannot do anything more complicated than compare and set, like, uh, you know, more, more involved to read, modify, write operations. So uh, the API is very restricted to fit in the particular use case that, uh, you know, these guys were trying to solve. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, uh, you know, from the, from, from the higher level, right, uh, the, the, the two do not really compare. Maybe maybe on the like a technical details, the, the, the protocol levels, there are some the comparison that we can uh, try to make, but uh, not from the, at least not from the usage standpoint of this two system. Any other comments? Yeah, this is, this is, yeah, this is co-design, as they say, co-design and um, uh, very specific to their use case and using of Caspexos with dirty reads, uh, dirty rights and like, uh, what I call but, but, but that's, a, that's another, you know, topic to like, consider, right? If you uh, just take off the shell components and, uh, you know, make something out of this, uh, black boxes together, uh, you know, you, you may have a solution, but what they say is by, by doing this code design, they can uh, make things much leaner. So like from, from the general like software engineering standpoint, right? 
uh, uh, I think that making a statement that this co-design uh, approach where they, you know, take these components and uh, essentially, yeah, merge them together, that, that makes, that gives them that benefit. So there is a question, the name was not written, but isn't the consensus protocol stated by uh, fine grain RSM same as speculative stack source or crash tolerant variant of ZISBA? Yeah, these are all, okay, I, uh, these are basically doing a test quorum, meaning that super majority quorum, meaning that uh, three fourths of the nodes uh, in the first thing, and if that fails, like in uh, EPAXOS, uh, doing another um, classical PAXOS round to get things right. I mean, the presentation was misleading, saying fast path and fast quorum. Uh, uh, but no, this has nothing to do with um, the um, uh, fast PAXOS or speculative PAXOS, or this was a uh, uh, crash tolerant uh, version. This is. Um, the speculation is just uh, the nodes uh, using the accepted uh, value for um, storing it for LSM maintenance rather than uh, having a commit uh, delivered to them before they could uh, they could do that. Anybody want to chime on this? Yeah, maybe the author of the question may have more insight. <laughs> I can add one more sentence here is that in the protocols like Ziziva and SpecPaxos, the clients directly get responses just after the, uh, I mean, primary sends the request and then they all just execute and send reply to the client. While mm -hmm. in this case, clients do not get final reply. First, they send the decision to the primary and then primary collects a response based on Quorum it got and then sends the reply to the client. So there, there's no, the replicas do not know whether everyone has reached a stable state. Here at least in this protocol, primary has an idea that replicas have reached a stable state. Right? Yeah. Because he gets a quorum. Yeah, I, I think Parath was mentioning something about fast paxos, right? The, the, there is a, like some similarity to what, you, what you're saying uh, in fast paxos, right? Uh, in fast paxos, actually, the clients talk to the replicas and the uh, so, so it's, it's not the clients that get the responses back from the replicas, but the clients directly talk to the replicas and then the replicas tell the leader whether they have reached the agreement or not. And then uh, uh, the client can learn from the leader or the, the Lorder node uh, about the success of the operation. So uh, I, I guess it just, you know, on, on a different way, right? It's not the clients learning from replicas, it's just clients talking to all replicas. But uh, but yeah, as Murad said, the speculation here is just on the uh, state of individual nodes in this RSM. Okay. Any other comments on this? The fourth one, uh, this is a comment. Uh, um, the paper says that they don't support their rights, right? They say that uh, uh, you only support uh, read modify right. Uh, there should be a read beforehand. But when you look at the paper, they are divorced, right? They first update the CAS, they first present the CAS processing, which is basically a CAS right. So there is nothing stopping a client basically doing a, a blind right. Um, I guess this is for Everything improving. stops a client from doing a blind right, right? The the actual implementation checks whether you have, whether you're supplying the, the, the right. Like they specifically went through the hurdles of restricting it. Right, right, right. But I don't have to always do a read before write, right? But if you don't do the read, you cannot provide the proper version. I could have a, I could have a, uh, if I do the plus right, I don't need to do a read before I could do a uh, write on top of it. I can just use the... Uh, how, how do you know you were the last writer if you're the client? No, I'm taking a chance, right? Mm. But again, it serializes the writes. It doesn't 
Yeah, I guess it doesn't allow the blind rights, meaning that if you didn't know what was the last clock, you could not um, you could not do the comparison. Okay, so that aside, we can speculate about why was the reason. I guess it's to improve programmability of the clients, right? Um, to maybe um, reduce the risk of um, uh, reduce the risk of um, harm from um, clients doing blind rights. My question is, question five is, does it have to do with the speculative execution? We, essentially, compare and set is like one level of protection against your state, and you have the speculative execution that, you know, makes your state less guarded, so to speak. Does compare and set have to do with the fact that they have the speculative execution, the dirty rights, as, uh, uh, as you said. What was the question? Uh, I guess the, qu the question is why compare and set? Why restrict it to compare and set operations? Why not allow blind rights? What can go wrong if you have blind rights? Because I, I have a feeling there is a reason, not just because they liked it, but there has to be a reason that this compare and set is doing something for, for, for them, maybe in terms of performance or uh, in terms of safety, uh, but I, I couldn't really uh, figure it out from the paper just yet. This could be a, a breakout room thing. We can just tentatively write it down. My my sense is this is for de-risking the uh, implementation. Um, you can shoot yourself in the foot if you allow any blind to do a uh, blind uh, right and maybe this is avoiding that. Yeah. If you think about yeah, it, maybe. maybe creating the keys at the line right, this can also yeah well, creating a key is not a line right. What they have is Maybe. Anybody want to join me? About four or five. The missing of line drives. Um, I think because we have uh, two things, right? Uh, the epoch number and the timestamp. So those, uh, like, um, those have to be the highest one so that uh, to reach the quorum. So that uh, to maintain that they are not allowing blind rights. And also, uh, I see that, uh, like, uh, suppose. And the quorum, when the quorum is accepted, that node becomes the owner of that particular key. So to achieve that as well. Uh... I mean, one, one quick thing is maybe if you use the same epoch number and even the same timestamp and have line rights. Well, yeah. see. W w one way this can take off the take off the chain before the uh, right, right? That would uh, solve the problem, but they don't want blind rights. Is my sense. Go ahead, yeah. Alex. In their in their model, uh, they actually say that uh, if you remember that uh, the, the uh, replicated state machine only operates on the assumption that they have the current state and the next state. The compare and set enforces that they they can only transition from uh, the current state to some state plus one. Like the comparing set operation uh, essentially uh, is like having this two items of a log, you know, uh, the current state and there is a, a, a transition. You, you cannot blindly transition from the current state to something else. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I didn't express myself properly, but. Well, this we can discuss this in one of the breakout rooms. I think this is a fair question to discuss. Okay, six. Alex, why don't you read this? Yeah, uh, that's, uh, I guess, another confusion point from me. Uh, in the paper, they say that um, the nodes do not maintain per key or per shard operation log, but instead skip over missed operations and directly determine the apply and apply the accepted value with the highest associated proposal number. So uh, essentially, they say that because there is no log, they can directly apply the value, right? At the same time, they have this compare and set. And uh, the question is, how can you directly apply something if you skipped an operation given the compare and set semantics, right? So if I skipped operation T and uh, operation T plus one comes in, uh, by their definition, I have to reject the T plus one because my state right now is T minus one. How does it apply T plus one? The answer to this they say that it doesn't have to be consecutive. If the last one was T, you have some skips T plus one, T plus two, etc. But the other one is T plus uh, five. That you can still go from two to uh, from T to T plus five. If I cannot the because of the comparing set. The comparing set for the T plus five operation will have T plus four in it. I will have the rejection on this operation. Do you get the rejection or? Since well, the, the, the note will send the reject. It will say, I cannot do it. I, I don't know if, if, the note, if the note still uh, writes it down. It says, I cannot do it, but still writes it into the um, um, LS entry. I don't know. It would not make sense to me if it does. Like, why, why so, are you saying no and still write it? The notes have PP. Last accepted promise and PA last accepted uh, value. The proposal numbers corresponding to this. Uh, if PP is for a preparation, ready. Okay. If the leader sends an accept message with the client specified timestamp, it was wrong. Of the replicas, including the leader, the exact messages process if the current time cell, if the key is still T, ah, and the number is greater than or equal to the local promise. Yeah. It says T. Yeah. Don't just skip once, do not increase T. Or do they do another read and uh, uh, well, read the, the thing would, this, the, 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 the thing would be recovered by this uh, lone read, but that, that, that happens when the leader changes, uh, when the when the Paxos leader changes, right? It doesn't happen. I may not even contact the node to read if, if I have a stable leadership. What is skipped operation? I, well, I, don't, I don't know what it's... it's because we don't get to the uh, quorum and timeout. I guess this is why you have the epoch changes. Huh? Maybe every single... No, no. The, there is a transient change. failure. You know, net network failed for, I don't know, uh, so, sometime the message got dropped or something. It times out, and this is basically saying that uh, uh, the right times out, the client gets a timeout, so it's a skip operation. It, it wasn't no, done. The, 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 right, the right doesn't time out. Oh. You have the majority of replicas still succeeding, the right goes on, one replica is, is timing out, you know, one note is timing out, doesn't apply this operation. A little bit later, it recovers. It has the uh, stale state, uh, and it cannot apply any more of the compare and set operations. I don't understand. Then why is it a skip? If, what do you mean? The leader did not get it, but the quorum For, forget about it. the leader. It's the it's the node that skips the operation. The node just didn't receive the operation for some reason. It skipped it. The leader still moves on. You you have the majority. The 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 clients get answered. Everything is fine. 
one node uh, has dropped one of the operations. Didn't receive it. I can. Can you repeat it again? For, forget about the later skip and stuff. It, it's not the leader, right? You have, uh, let's say, three nodes. You know, you, you need the quorum of two. Two nodes are healthy. They keep going. T, T plus one, T plus two, T plus three, and so on. And then one node, uh, maybe it has a temporary failure, you know, transient failure. It, it failed to receive T plus two. And then uh, later it receives T plus three. So one node is stuck at state T plus one and received the T operation T plus three. It cannot accept it because of compare and set. The rest of the cluster moves on. Yeah. Right? So what they're saying is, if the operation is skipped, the node just applies the latest one. But how does it apply the latest one if, it ha if it's bound by the compare and set uh, restriction? Uh, to add something here, I think they are disconnecting the, uh, the cast that the client uses from what the state machine actually applies. I don't think when, uh, the, when the operations are applied, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think the CAS is respected at that point. They just treat them as write operations. Only the client sees the operations as CAS. They don't allow clients to do any other operation than CAS. I think Alex just mentioned uh, the um, the, the I mean, that's, a, that's a valid answer. Uh, that's a valid answer. That's, that's what I've been thinking. It just makes it for even more complicated kind of... That's, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Can you, can you summarize? I mean, you were talking about just a, a replica um, missing yeah. an well, operation. Murat, every replica has its own state machine. They're completely dis disjoint, right? The sure. only thing that links them is the fact that they're going to apply the same operations because of CAS. I guess that answers my other question. But can you repeat that? So how? If I have a CAS, if I have a time T, right? All of my replicas uh, are the state T. And then the command comes in T plus one. They're all going to apply this T plus one, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm asking, what happens if one of these replicas, you know, in this hypothetical scenario, if one of the replicas, let's say, missed T plus one, mm -hmm. right? So it has the state T, it missed T plus one. The other two replicas apply T plus one. Uh, yeah. But one, one node has missed T plus one. Then the operation yes. T plus two comes in. The yeah. normal replicas are going to say, okay, T plus, I have T plus one, uh, I'm applying T plus two, everything is fine, right? What does the failed replica you're going to do when it recovers? It has the state T, it needs to apply T plus 2. That's a compare and set violation. It's not failed, just, it was just a message drop. Well, yeah, it, it, it had a transient failure. It, it has a wrong state, it's not cut up. It has the CAS violation. What does it mean for this replica? Does it apply T plus 2? It doesn't even know it failed. Let's say the message drop. Well, well yeah, yeah. Does it apply T plus 2? That, that's what the uh, Balaji says, and that's what I'm thinking as well, that it has to apply T plus 2 to internal state, regardless of what it has. How does but, it apply T plus 2? Does it read it from a back channel, like the LSM? No, it, it received a T plus 2. It, it dropped T plus 1. The, the messages keep coming. Why T plus 1, then? Because it dropped it. It never received it. Never happened. So, what's next? I mean, it didn't have T plus 1. It needs to yeah. learn it. How does it learn? No, it doesn't learn it. That's, that's what the skip means. It says you skip it and you apply C plus two. That's what the author of the paper means. I'm saying if you apply C plus two, you, you're violating compare and set at the particular node. Why does the algorithm say that you, in the accept handler, the algorithm just says uh, the opposite, right? In the section 3.2, CAS processing, it says accept handler. At each of the replicas, including the leader, the accept message is processed. If the current timestamp associated with the key is still T, and the proposal number is greater than or equal to the local promise, blah, 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 proposal. Yeah, yeah that, that means leader hasn't changed. No, the, times, the, the leader increases the timestamp for yeah. every update. I missed an update. Yeah, you, so you, I'm just applying. Update, your state is T. Uh, my update is gonna come in, the cast says, 
uh, I, I want to transition from T plus one to T plus two. You don't yes. have T plus one. You have a cast rejection. Does it still mean you apply T plus two to your store or not? So you reject it to the leader. Do you apply T plus two? If you don't uh, apply T plus two, you, you will never recover the state. You'll never cut up, you get cut up. Oh, I see, I see. So do you apply T plus two even though you just send the rejection or not? Uh, this can lead to some safety violation because this is from my point of view. What if everybody thinks they are the one that's missing something? Yeah, I'm not very confident with this, but I see what you're saying. So you are saying you send a reject, but you still apply. And I'm thinking, does this lead to safety violation problem? Because if okay. you don't apply, right? The way I initially understood, you don't apply C plus two, then you're stuck uh, forever. You, there's no way to recover. The only way for you to recover is to apply whatever you hope is the, the latest value at this point, which is T plus two. Okay. Tricky. I don't know if it would I, I, I guess it's fine because if the majority didn't reject, then the majority actually had T plus one, so you still have the proper con continuation of your you know, history or whatever, transitions. But if the majority are going to reject, you know, one applied T plus two, another applied T plus whatever, three, they, they all send rejects, then you'll have to do the, uh, I guess, re election, the read and recovery. Okay, next question, then we will do the breakout sessions. Uh, Abhinit, can you read this? Yeah, so like initially in the paper, they say, right, uh, that uh, the data of the customer needs to be like kept in the same node or same machine, as well as the computation needs to be done in the same machine so that uh, there is least latency. So, uh, so when they come to this FRSM, how do they ensure that? Yeah, I, my understanding, there is a cluster management service that makes these decisions and um, updates this using the FRSM. For SM, just less the cluster management service to, uh, based on its policies of collocation as much as possible, etc. FRSM is the vessel to do them, but the cluster management service reads and does them. Yeah, they briefly mentioned that they use something like Zookeeper to allocate the key ranges to different uh, leaders, right, to different nodes. So that, that, that may be the mechanism where they reshuffle the key ranges between the nodes in the cluster to uh, maybe adjust to some locality. Okay. But uh, I, I don't think paper talks about this and they mentioned Zookeeper in like one sentence very briefly. So. Yeah, I mean, one, one of my big problems with this paper is, right, so there is the um, per key to leader allocations, where is this maintained, etc. and then it's maintained at Zookeeper. So. <laughs> And uh, we still have uh, uh, cast boxes and uh, yeah, it gets confusing because of that. I, I have mean, one final question. Uh, if, I want to know, like in this paper, the there's a difference between the fast and the slow part. And it depends on the ownership of the uh, data item. If the ownership is there, then the leader will start with the fast part, otherwise he will switch to the slow. Yeah. Um, the point is, is there a way we can actually switch or migrate ownership or, I mean, otherwise if an owner does not have, then he'll always go for a slower path and he will actually be, that will be detrimental. So is there a way to switch the ownership because that will be much more interesting and much more better for the program? Um, good, good question. We don't know how the ownership is done. I guess there's Zookeeper and you can do this, but I guess the owner still should, uh, complete one Paxos round to have its uh, proposal, go through a phase one once to own it. Uh, yeah, the, the entire process. This is a um, hint. Zookeeper serves as a hint uh, and you change it there. Even if you are not the leader, you can still 
get an operation across, right? By doing phase one, phase two, etc. You want to have stable leaders as much as possible. Maybe the zookeeper is just a hint. So I don't know. I have it, theories. It's, it, it, it's not a hint, Murat. It's it's more like a two-tier uh, approach, right? So zookeeper tells which node supposed to own the key, and then. Uh, the, the leadership of this key is, is this joint. So ideally you have the uh, owner is the leader of the taxes. But in case of the failures, the owner may be down, then you have a different leader that, that has to take over. So, and when the original node recovers, uh, you know, the, the, the staff has to migrate back. Uh, that, that's what they describe in section 5.1 to, to a degree. Uh, uh, and this, Comes as a hint, right? Because hint is hint means it's not necessarily true. Uh, our yeah, current as I said, two, two tier. Most of the times it's true. It's not true only in presence of the failures. If you need to change it permanently, you have to change it at the the zookeeper management level, whatever. Uh, yeah. And and that's why uh, they also mentioned that uh, for for these failures, right? When uh, so the owner is down, there is a new leader elected for the key. Uh, the read operations are now going to be not read from leader, but read from quorum. Okay. Right, so this is where the, the fast, so th their fast uh, read is actually one of their slower reads because their slowest read is, is this process of leader change. So there is a process of leader change. When the owner died, uh, you try to read. There is no way to read from the owner. You go to a different node. Uh, that has to run phase one of taxes to get the leader election, and then get phase two, uh, you know, to get the the, the, the quorum, right? So th that's the slow read. And then the fast read is once you've already been elected, but you're still not the owner, you still read from the quorum all the time, and, and they somehow restrict you from actually becoming the leader and allowing you to read from your own store for quite some time. So it, it gets a little bit more complicated there with, once again, not the perfect explanation, but... Uh. So related, related follow-up to everybody, I mean, for the read processing, there are three modes, right? Read, leader only reads. When the operation is routed to the leader, as you can state, the leader checks whether it's operating in the leader only mode where all of its key value pairs have a shard level scan. What is shard level scan? I mean, it's slow, I guess, but... And how much is this valid for? I mean, normally you do leader only read if you have a leader lease, but what's going on here? Is it again the two-phase thing that you are the leader in Zookeeper and I don't know. Well, well, uh, what? Go ahead. I think he means that he read from the stable storage about what uh, what is the current value for each key. And I think this operation has to be done over all uh, Disks, not only the the leader only, because may, maybe something was is missing from its uh, partition. And that would be slow, isn't it? Yeah, but but it happened once. So once it said it to be the owner, is the owner. So that that's in case of uh, changing the leader. So he will have to do that. Other after that, he he the owner. Yeah, that's what I understand at least. What guards it from being changed without uh, me knowing, right? So, so I think once he done that, he is the owner now. Done the reading the charts. What if due to failure, etc., another leader emerged, and uh, I don't know about this. So this is this leaves something. In there, right? Because the second one is like the, the quorum read. The quorum read says, okay. Yeah, so 
the basic reads from Lira, right? When you when you don't go for the quorum, uh, it, it is uh, expecting the um, what is it? The commit flag. Uh, how do chosen. they call it? Chosen. chosen flag. Yeah. So if you have the chosen flag, you don't have to, and, and you still you know have this leader list or whatever. So you know you have a way of knowing that you are the list, uh, the leader, and no one has been picked because of some time in or time out, so releases, right? That way, uh, you know, you, you don't have to reach out to any of the nodes, but that's how the local reads happen. Now, when the... You are suggesting there is also leader reads going on here? Lead, leader releases going on? Yeah, of here. course, of course. By Zookeeper, most likely. Uh, and so <laughs> so if you have the lease and, and you, you know, you have the, uh, the, the flag set, right that then you can read locally if you don't have the lease or don't have the flag then you have to go and read from the quorum whenever the original owner fails uh, it will not have the flag anyway because the flag is set only at the uh, at the guy who orchestrated the previous write operation so essentially you have to go through the uh, quorum reads all the time anyway until you maybe have collected enough operations set enough of flags of your own and you can start yeah, I'm not sure there, <laughs> but, but the flag has to do with that as well. So do we want to do breakout sessions? I guess there's only 15 minutes remaining and we took too much uh, time because there were several things unclear. I guess we can discuss what's the better way to solve this problem in maybe 10 minutes, maybe let's have two breakout rooms. And the second one could be just debugging our understanding of the paper. Do you guys want to do it or do you guys want to have a, because here, I guess, unfortunately, a couple people dominate discussion, but um, if we do breakout session, maybe we can have more chance to discuss. Everybody has chance to discuss. But, you know, please speak up and, <laughs> uh, we could also discuss like we did with those questions in the remaining yeah. 15 minutes, right? Yeah, sure. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. Done. I mean... Okay, let, let's say we are given this problem. How would we solve the problem? We don't know the CASPEX so, or we don't have to choose the CASPEX so, or FRSM. Uh, yeah, we understand the traditional way of course grant uh, runs into issues with uh, head of line blocking and uh, screw in the uh, screw in the uh, load. We can use per key mapping of uh, leaders uh, to per key mapping of keys to leaders. That it could be a static mapping or it could be a mapping that we can change uh, again. Uh, maybe slowly based on policy, but what could be alternative ways to solve this problem? It's a huge question. These guys had a couple years to <laughs> solve the problem. But. So, uh, related to this point only, the point which you have raised, I mean, one of the points which I wrote in the first one that because like, I'm still unclear why is there the notion that they have used this why did they want to use shard? I mean, a set of replicas sharing multiple shards. Can't we have key maps to one shard and each shard maintained by same set of replica? Wouldn't that be much more easier and faster? And that you can apply protocols like EPAX or the other, other protocols which are multiple primaries. That will be an easier and that already provides you because everyone will act, act as a different primary at, at any point of time. So wouldn't that be easier? I'm just curious, this, no, I, this way it, ownership has to be transferred to different people, ownership has to be changed, then another round has to run. Why? I'm just curious about that question. Well, valid, valid question, I think. Because if you make it too fine grain, then there is a more overhead when you need to do stealing, etc. 
uh, we, are, we are basically saying that uh, you know uh, instead of two core screens, would there be like micro shards or smaller shards that uh, we still could do this? Why did we make the shard to be at the level of one one key? Is that an accurate representation of your question? Yes, and why do we need multiple replicas to maintain multiple shards? I mean, what, what does it mean by, I'm just curious, what does it mean by multiple replicas to maintain multiple shards? Why can't just one replica be associated with one shard? And That's one shard have some set of keys. Uh, I think the idea comes from uh, Spanner, I guess. Spanner had this way of having multiple shards per uh, node, so they could do bin packing. Uh, I, th I think that was the approach uh, why Spanner do did this. Maybe they have the same intuition why they are doing it. Yes, but I'm I'm not I'm not understanding what is the advantage of this idea. I mean, so generally the sharding when traditional distributed protocols have used sharding was the ideas to improve throughput. In this case, what um, I mean, sharding was used to improve storage or multiple set of replicas can work in parallel so that they can actually run consensus in parallel run something to to get more throughput or more le reduce latency why why was the need of having multiple replicas holding different shard at the same point in time logical i'm not understanding I, i'm not understanding what is the gain of this right design uh, think about uh, this is if the shards are big yeah have one shard per replica but uh, big shard also leads to problems that uh, they mentioned, head of line blocking, because some, whichever way you pack, some shard would be, could be more, um, uh, could be receiving more traffic. Uh, um, uh, I see it's head of line blocking, right? So you know, thousands of, um, uh, multiple thousands of keys. Um, it would have um, head of line blocking. So they say we have to make the shards smaller. If you make the shards smaller, uh, you would um, each replica would now have multiple shards, uh, not responsible for one shard, right? Anybody else can chime in on this? Yeah, the, the, the entire shards and approach, right? It's it's just to give them more uh, more, more throughput from existing hardware, right? So in 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 the, in the most basic scenario, right? If you just have multi packs, one multi packs, one big shard. Well, actually, let, let's start with what shard is, right? So let's say you have a hundred keys, you know, zero to ninety-nine. Uh, if you have one shard, you know, the, the shard is the portion of the keys, right? So if you just have one shard, you have all the shards in the same, or all the keys in the same bucket, right? So you have, you run one multi access to manage all of your keys. Now, if you have two shards, you may have keys, you know, zero to 49 and one multi access box uh, across three machines. And then uh, another set of keys, you know, 50 to 99 in a second multi access box uh, across three of the same or different machines, right? But uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, if you keep dividing your key space into smaller and smaller groups, now you have uh, less and less problems about uh, uh, what if some uh, you know expensive operation on key you know one blocks me right? If you have one shard, this expensive operation will block everything. So you're not you're wasting resources because nothing else can work. If you have two shards, then at least some other thing can work. So you can still use uh, get some utilization of your hardware because. You know, one's operation is small, slow, but the, you know, the other shard is not slow, it can still progress. If you keep dividing your key space further and further, uh, you, you know, this blockings no, no longer really impact your hardware utilization. So you can potentially scale more on the same, on the same hardware. All right, so uh, I guess does it, does it answer your question? <laughs> I mean, I, I I already was in support of the sharding. I was never saying sharding is a bad idea. I was never. I was yeah. only of the position why multiple replicas holding different shards because then they have to 
participate. Yes, there, there's a, there are advantage of that. I mean, they can participate in multiple concerns of different shards at the same point in time. Uh, or in the other side, I said, they just hold one single shard and then they can uh, perform a protocol where everyone is a leader. So, I mean, I think I, you're right in one sense, it depends on the sort of, it depends on sort of an application they are looking at. I mean, if their system requirements requires that design, then that that's logical. Otherwise, it depends basically on the design, I believe. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, I think it is basically they are block storage system. So they're basically like storing the customer data. So here when the like, suppose there are multiple key value pairs and uh, then only just few of them are being modified, then why others should just uh, like sit uh, there, uh, it's, it's not like the maximum utilization of the SSD as Alexi mentioned. So maybe that is like a more pain point for them that uh, a better usage of SSD by distributing uh, the key value pairs uh, and uh, yeah. I also think it may be a reason with the implementation of the consensus itself. So if you have like a single threaded implementation, then necessarily a sharding will improve your multi-core performance. Uh, otherwise you may have to go with an implementation like ePaxos or e double ePaxos. I don't know uh, what, like if they are willing to make that transition, right? To a more complex protocol uh, in an already complex system. So maybe sharding is just like an easy way of exploiting the core performance out of a single threaded Paxos implementation. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a good point actually. And uh, you know, by, by design, Paxos is a synchronous protocol. So you, you will have a, a big portions of the protocols that are blocking. So, so the, the, it, it's inherently single thread. Uh, at least for, for some parts of it, right? So, uh, and, and sharding, yeah, it's, it's a cheap way to, uh, you know, move the workload to multiple machines. So you maybe one shard on a set of three machines, another shard on a, set, a different set of three machines. So you can scale horizontally with your machines. Uh, you can uh, scale with respect to your, you know, locks that, that have in, a, in, a, in an application on the same machine. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's a valid point. I'm just curious about one more thing because they are using sharding. In general, sharding reduces fault tolerance. For example, if, if the sharding is being, I'm just curious about thinking, does it actually reduce fault tolerance here? Because if, if the Paxos says that there should be 2F plus 1 replicas and that allows it to handle around like around 50% of the uh, fault tolerance, now here there is shard. Does it actually reduce fault tolerance in this case or not? Because it has been observed. I, I cannot say about this application as such, but I've seen other papers, at least in the BFT settings, as soon as sharding is being used, and if the shards third assumption is that every shard will have some sort of some set set of replicas. Uh, the number there is three of plus one. If that is a number, then it reduces fault tolerance overall the system. Does it actually reduce fault tolerance here or not? I'm just curious about that. Uh, well, from like kind of high level uh, observation, right? Uh, each shard is going to be supported by a multi paxos by a paxos box. So if you have three, uh, so, so the shard is still going to be living on some three replicas, uh, right? So if one replica dies, you still have the same fault tolerance when it comes to the set, to, to the shard. Um, so you know, each shard is its own Paxos box that has the same fault tolerance. Um, I think some of the complication may come from the fact that, you know, if I have, let's say, 10 shards, right, um, and I have three nodes or four, or four nodes or whatever, uh, I may have one node be the leader of some shards and be not the leader of other shards. If I crash that node, uh, if this node crashes, then the shards 
where that node was not a leader will have a smaller impact on their performance versus the shards where that node was the leader. Because uh, in one case, they, they can just move on, they can mask the failure. In another case, they have to go through the leader election. Uh, so that's going to be the penalty on uh, availability. But uh, like uh, from uh, a general like Paxos standpoint, right? We are not changing anything about the Paxos uh, to reduce the full tolerance. Okay. Any any ending comments? Um, um, next week paper is Kellogg. I think nobody took next week paper, right? We still we need a presenter. If you want to present the paper, um, yep, yeah, it's up for grabs. The Kellogg paper. If you want to be a presenter for Kellogg paper, this also appeared in NSTI two thousand. Uh, 20 seamless reconfiguration to seamless reconfiguration and total order in a scalable shape log. If you want to volunteer for it, uh, send me an email, reach me out, and uh, uh, you can do a 20 minute presentation before the discussion. And now we can finish in a couple minutes if you want to say a um, couple more things. We have time. So, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think it was a good discussion today, actually, and uh, really good presentation. So, um, uh, I guess I just want to say uh, thank you, Mo, uh, for you know doing the presentation, writing the summary. Yeah, thank you. Any ending comments? I mean, uh, paper, I guess also the polls also showed that the paper was not so well organized and written. So uh, that increased the duration of the discussion and we couldn't do the breakout sessions. Yeah. Feel free to chime in if you have some uh, things to point out. Yeah, well, we can take it offline at this point, I guess we have Slack. So. Yeah, there's always Slack and you can also write comments there, but uh, maybe one more minute to uh, give you some chance to speak up before we uh, stop it and I believe it's a uh, like a good optimization over Paxos. Like yeah, more refinement might be required, but a good idea to implement and reduce the latency. Yeah, there might be some gaps, but uh, uh, the problems can be more refined and discussed. Yeah, yeah I think not having logs is still very useful. Uh, because logs is also a pain to manage. And this is not a bad idea. And um, I, I think this year's trend is to have these kind of read, modify, write uh, operations which are lightweight and optimize the uh, you know, consensus uh, uh, for these lightweight operations. So. Uh, this was, I think, a continuation of that thing that we have seen through Hermes, Griff, and this one. Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you for attending. I will make the recording available and um, let's see what will the next week's paper bring up. It's again on the topic of uh, Paxos and uh, distributed coordination. And um, feel free to volunteer and feel free to point out uh, new papers. Okay. Bye bye.